Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. For all of our lives, the dollar has been the king of currencies around the world. But is that about to change? Let's get to the bottom line. What's happening to the almighty U.S. dollar? For decades, it was the reserve currency of the international oil trade, which propped up its value and its demand from Albania to Zambia. But now more and more countries are making deals to trade oil in other currencies as an alternative to the dollar. And that raises questions about the current world order, which is run by the United States, period. China might be leading the way in the de-dollarization efforts, but more and more countries are jumping on that bandwagon, like Russia, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia. How nations trade in oil and gas has helped keep the dollar, a.k.a. the petrodollar, at the top of the heap. Do recent shifts mean that America and the dollar are being downgraded as the world creates alternatives? Today we're speaking with someone who really knows how our world's economy works and the important role of oil in all of this. He is Daniel Jurgen, the vice chairman of S&P Global, historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author of several books, but most recently, The New Map, Energy, Climate and the Clash of Nations. But in this, you foretold really the Ukraine crisis, you foretold what the world needed to worry about by way of various squeezes on oil and gas that could come either through climate policies or from Russia weaponizing energy. As you look at it now, what's the situation? Well, I think if you look at it now, of course, you were seeing all these trends unfold. And I think no one, I mean, I did see a war coming over Russia and the West over Ukraine. Didn't see it as something that would go on for over a year. And I don't think anybody did. Vladimir Putin certainly did not. He thought it'd be over in five days, and his troops brought their dress uniforms for a victory parade. Uh, there are a number of other big themes in the new map, but clearly the other that's so significant goes to what you're talking about, about the dollar, is the fact that the U.S. and China have moved from what I called in the new map the WTO consensus, we're all in it together, we're all in globalization, to this incredible, increasingly sharp, great power competition and around the world, when I talk to world leaders in different continents, they all say, we don't want to have to choose between one side or the other, but that's where we are now. So where does this go? Because I think the way you just framed it is really interesting. Because if you end up with a very divided world, and you end up with Europe and the United States in one camp, maybe Japan, you end up with other parts of the world that may have, you know, India hedging its bets, uh, uh, Russia and China tying up. Is that a world where the transatlantic relationship has enough room to run. Well, the transatlantic relationship has become a lot more important, especially since this, this war started. And one of the things, one of the many miscalculations that Vladimir Putin made was he assumed that NATO would fall apart, that high gas, uh, natural gas prices would cause political change in Europe. It's had the opposite effect. What he's done is he's really revivified NATO, and the world is increasingly starkly divided in a way that we wouldn't have thought about three or four or five years ago. So what does this do to things like the dollar and also China's role? I've been wondering for a while, you know, Russia used to be a geostrategic threat to China. And China used to look at the United States as a nation it cooperated with, but sometimes uh, uh, was rivals with, but it wasn't an intense rivalry. And now you look at it where Russia and China coming together has huge implications for the world, given the fa this fact that soon China will be the largest economy in the world, uh, and it's buying well, assets. Although, let me world. say that yeah. there is now some debate, as, and we, we all kind of assume the World Bank, everybody said by 2028, China's right. larger. The slowdown in China, the population issues, productivity, it may not be, but it still may be. Well, it's going to be a big, yeah. big way. But if the Chinese... And by, and by the way, Steve, yeah. the key thing is for many countries around the world, in the developing world, China is their most important market in Latin America. I've heard it from the president of one of the countries right. in Latin America said, we have a strategic relationship with the United States, but by the way, China is our most important market. I mean, if you go to area after, you know, all around the world, you hear that, whether it's Southeast Asia, whether it's Africa, whether it's Latin America, whether it's even many nations in Europe. But I guess the question is, if China and Russia, oil producers begin to look at, because you've taught me more than anyone else that oil undergirds the value, the reserve currency uh, value of the dollar. And the question is whether that is eroding as China uh, begins to do deals where oil and energy can be traded in other currencies, and they bring in the Saudis to do that, and that 
reserve currency status of the dollar erodes as you get baskets of other currencies. Are we anywhere near seeing the reserve currency va status of the dollar fall? Well, I think we're seeing, the word you used, erosion, I think is the right word. And in fact, one of the former secretaries of Treasury has warned that if you use sanctions too much, it creates an impetus to find alternatives. Even crypto is an alternative to the dollar. But it really, what brought it home to me was one of the things I write about in the new map is a meeting I observed in Moscow between President Xi Jinping and President Putin. And uh, Putin said to Xi Jinping, I apologize to you. I've kept you up till 4 a.m. talking. And Xi Jinping replies, it's okay. We never have enough time to talk about. One of the main things they clearly talk about is, is changing the international order in which the U.S. and the U.S. dollar plays this central role. They want a different kind of world, oil, world order. And in this case, of course, as a result of the war, I think Russia's action, and we can get into it, is no longer going to be an energy superpower, but it will increasingly be a dependency of China. And I think the really interesting thing is, and I'm going to probably get a lot of negative mail for this, is when you think about having the reserve currency status of the dollar or uh, you've got a you know, transnational public good, which the United States is the anchor of, it means bad guys deal, do deals in your currency. It mean, means that thugs and criminal gangs and you know, bad people out there use your currency because that's the currency for everyone. Once you begin sanctioning or blocking or using the SWIFT system to undermine transactions, isn't it logical that those players then go and try and find alternatives? Yeah, they have a tremendous impetus to do it. Now, so far, I think if you see uh, barrels of oil priced in yuan, it still refers back to a dollar price at this point. It isn't, a, it isn't like you've entered a separate universe. It's still, so it's not a fully honest yeah, 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 replacement of the yeah, dollar. Yeah, and it become, but it, it's a symbolic message, but it's still anchored in the dollar. And if you really think about this whole world economy since World War II, what has enabled globalization, which enabled these, all these connections that have made you know, economic growth possible, it's, uh, the dollar has been a bedrock for it. You know, one of the things that's begun to emerge is we've seen Chinese diplomacy take flight. And uh, I was in the Middle East, I think I was talking to you, and uh, when I was over there, news broke that the uh, foreign minister, uh, who used to be ambassador of China to the United States, had brokered a deal uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, we've also seen uh, just recently French President Macron in Beijing basically saying, we're not that fully aligned with the United States on issues like Taiwan. What's going on? Well, I, I think what we've seen is that China is now become an assertive power in global diplomacy. And although initially people will say, and it was the Saudis had a strong interest for some kind of stabilization because Yemen and the Houthis and those attacks from, on Saudi facilities, on Saudi cities, uh, is deeply destabilizing. So I think they had an interest. Iran's economic position is so bad, but it is that they had an interest. But the fact that China could claim to have done it, that's a pretty powerful message. And of course, it's a complicating message because there's one country that the U.S. Uh, is very much arrayed against in the Middle East is, of course, Iran. But, I mean, well, I'm going to get into that in just a second, but, you know, there, you know, China also signed a 25-year deal with Iran called the Strategic Cooperation Agreement. Um, I mean, that, so we're looking, are we looking at a structural shift there of essentially the anti-Western axis? Well, I wouldn't go that far because I think, yes, in terms of Russia, obviously, in terms of Iran, the thing that gets overlooked in all the discussions is how integrated the U.S. and Chinese economies are. Even as we talk about People talk about reshoring or friendshoring, moving supply chains. These two economies are so interconnected. Sometimes I think the leaders and the political leaders don't realize how connected they are and how fundamental that is to the global economy. I mean, economy. China is America's largest trading partner. Yeah. I think we do more than $700 billion yeah. of trade each year. So it is enormously, that you never hear that in Washington. Yeah, that just, and there's a sense, I, I was in a meeting not so long ago where I heard people say, well, we'll move all the supply chains. It's much more complicated than that. I mean, we have two really big trading partners. One is China, of course, the other is Canada. But uh, the, the Chinese one, you know, parts, just everything, it doesn't run with, without it. Now, you know Saudi Arabia history and behavior better than anyone I know. And you know the realities of what they can do in terms of oil production. They've just 
uh, decided to cut another million barrels of oil production and you know, half a million. Or ha oh, is it half? A, excuse me for that. But I think when you got to stay on top of these things, you know, when it you, changes. When you, you know, sort of look at the the, uh, the direction things are going, I'm just interested in whether Saudi Arabia at this point is beginning to feel its muscles coming back in terms of being a global power, dictating uh, price of oil for the United States, and hedging its bets on a relationship with President Biden's White House that it may not like too much. Well, I think it's, it's true. I mean, Saudi Arabia is in a different position today. Clearly, uh, it's going through a big program of economic reform. And when you're there, you can see it sort of unfolding in mm -hmm. front of your eyes. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of oil revenues flowing into the country that are being deployed in a lot of different ways. And I think Saudi Arabia sees itself as a, not only a regional power, but as a global power and certainly as a global economic power. And there's a degree of confidence there uh, that has come with a new generation uh, playing such a decisive role in the country. Did the U.S. mismanage that relationship? Did Joe Biden mismanage that relationship? Well, I wouldn't want to judge that but, I mean, one. But, but it raised, I mean, the Saudis, you know, different pockets of Saudi Arabia gave Jared Kushner a $2 billion fund to play with. That doesn't look like that affection has been, you know, transferred to well, the Well, I think the relationships are not as, you know, that relationship has gone up and down over time. I think it has been stressed. I think the United States needs to look very carefully at the region, and, and that relationship with Saudi Arabia is going to become more important in the world economy. And so I think that there is a need to have a better understanding. But Saudi Arabia is in a different place today than it was in the past, and it, it sees itself as a global player in the way it did not in the past. And do you think that this is going to consolidate further? I know there's a BRICS meeting coming up this summer to sort of look at uh, potentially bringing in new members uh, uh, to OPEC, you know, adding and expanding that group. Are there geostrategic consequences that would flow from those developments? I think so. I think, uh, and remember, Russia still uh, continues to be a charter member of the BRICS. I think it's important that one of the things that I think has been left out of the discussions here in this country is an understanding of the perspectives of the global south on these global issues, uh, on how the U.S. phrases them, and also on the issues uh, of energy. Mm. And again, the Global South looks to, uh, uh, you know, China's a main market. The very interesting country is the position of India, mm. which on the one hand is uh, India and China have their own very big historic rivalry and competition, and have been uh, exchanging of bullets. But India is also hedging its bets, and I think you used that word before, in terms of its relationship with Russia, because it does not it does not want to see Russia get too close to China. So there are other games being played that the U.S. is actually part of right now. Dan, you know, I'm, we're having a very heady discussion full of foreign policy and economic policy and oil and energy. But if you read your book, to me, what's so wonderful about it is that it reads for me like a Netflix series, if you will, maybe an HBO well, series, that it's full of vignettes of unusual moments uh, people's stories of how they impacted this, exchanges between individuals that is full of serendipity, that if certain things didn't yes. happen, we would not be in the place where, where we are. Can and I we, give you a great example? Yeah, give me an example, because I, 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 I love wonderful. these stories. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I, as a, somebody who writes history, you know, we, there's a tendency to think everything is preordained, that, right. but actually history is full of accidents. For instance, a lunch in Los Angeles at a fish restaurant in 19, uh, 2003, uh, Elon Musk, having made a lot of money with PayPal, is having lunch with a young electric fanatic, almost, I won't call him fanatic, but enthusiast named J.B. Straubel, who wants to get him to do an electric airplane. And Musk says, I'm not interested in that. He says, well, what about an electric car? He says, I'm interested in that. That becomes Tesla. And a, a few years ago, Elon Musk said, if that lunch hadn't occurred, there might not have been a Tesla and we not, might not be seeing all the automakers in the world hustling to develop electric cars. And, you know, if that lunch hadn't been there, history might have been different. Well, it raises the question for me of what other vignettes and moments you're storing up that we may not see. Because, you know, I know the new book is out now. But, but these moments, we're looking at cobalt, lithium, geostrategic competition, oil and energy, the dollar, whether or not... We, we look at these kind of highbrow issues too seriously, that there are really interesting questions down below about, I don't know, Chinese pride or 
uh, Russian sense of humiliation, which yeah. I, I, you know, driving you well, know, some abhorrent well, I mean, things in Ukraine. Yeah. But uh, you know, Germany giving up its nuclear uh, yeah. plan. I mean, I'm just wondering if there are other well, vignettes there, we should be aware yeah, of. Yeah, well, the ones I'm, I'm really interested, you mentioned minerals, copper and so forth, coal. coal. I'm really quite obsessed with that right now huh. because uh, there's this notion that in 25 years we can do an energy transition from an economy that's 80% hydrocarbons to one that sort of is net zero. And it's going to require an enormous amount of minerals, and people haven't really looked at the amount of minerals that are necessary. So we, our company S&P Global, did this eight-month study on it, and some of it's reflected in the new edition of mm. the new map. Uh, and, you know, an electric car is two and a half times more copper than a traditional car. I mean, things like that that people are not thinking. You add it up and you say, well, wait a second, the world's going to be a lot more focused, not only on big oil, it's going to start thinking about big shovels, about mining a lot more than it has in the past. Well, I mean, I think it's raised the interesting question about energy transitions because you talk about the history of them. And actually, history transitions are not neat and clean, right? You know, oil uh, uh, may have come along and knocked out coal, but we still use a lot of coal. In fact, it's more in demand than ever before. Oil or overtook coal in the 1960s. Today, the world uses three times as much coal. And last year was the highest coal consumption in the history of the world. So how does this look like when you're kind of moving towards a mineral-focused, um, I guess, would be a strategic race, which, you know, a kind of the next great race, if you will, in that arena. How, is, how are the great powers positioned well, in that? Well, that that's a crucial question, because over here you have net zero, got to get all these minerals for it. Over here you have great power competition, U.S. and China. They come together because China, because, you know, uses half the world's copper, has built up a, an inordinately strong position in all these minerals and mining and processing, 80% mm -hmm. of solar panels, 80% of lithium ion batteries. And, you know, now if you look so at did the, they see the squeeze coming before I think they other I think great they, states? I think they initially did it because they were trying to assure that they had the, the raw materials they needed for their rapid economic development. But I think it's now taken on this uh, very much a strategic uh, concept for them. And if you look at this uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the United right. States, it's also a compete with China Act. Net zero policies, which are coming down the pike fast and furious, and they are, you, you, you hear them talked about, you talk about climate movements as actually mattering. And is there a point where the net zero policies come along and create shocks of their own and hard choices when it comes to policy? Because the people behind net zero policies see a different race, which is, the world burning up and getting right. hotter and hotter and not being able to maintain this. So I'm just interested in your insights well, into was, what looks to me like a collision course. Well, yeah, I think, there, I, mean, I think there are four things to think about energy transition. One is what we started at the beginning, return of energy security. Sorry, now Europe two years ago didn't want U.S. LNG. Now U.S. LNG, liquefied natural gas, uh, along with LNG from other countries, including Qatar and Australia, mm. is a fundament, a fundament now of uh, foundation of European energy security. Uh, the second thing is just the scale of change in a hundred trillion dollar economy, how quickly. Third, and we kind of alluded to it, is this north-south, a new north-south divide on issues of climate and energy. And fourth, the mineral thing. So I think they're all there. So I think it's important to be realistic about this. And uh, at least some economists say if you try and push the 2050 goals into 2030 too rapidly, mm. you will have, to use your phrase, economic shocks. What happens with the global south, which is another part of this equation, which often gets neglected. I think they feel neglected. And as they're growing, one of my obsessions is where is tomorrow's rising global middle class going to be? It's really not the terms of net additions to global middle class are not in the transatlantic relationship. They're in all these other parts Their populations of the world are shrinking. That, that, that don't have the same economics of energy as the developed world has. So here's a, a, you wanted an anecdote. So yeah. I, I was chairing a seminar with African energy ministers, and they were complaining about their inability to get finance from European banks to develop things like natural gas pipelines. So they don't have to, women don't have to spend two hours a day gathering wood. They don't have indoor air pollution, which kills people and so forth. And the, the energy minister, I think it was from Senegal, she said, you know, they've taken away the finance. She said, it's like they've taken away the ladder. What do they expect us to do? Jump? or fly. And I think that's a very strong message uh, from uh, the South, that they have different priorities. As 
as the former energy uh, petroleum minister of India said, there's not an energy transition. There are energy transitions, plural, because if you're India, you have a very different thing. An energy transition for you is going from burning wood to using uh, natural gas for uh, cooking. You know, would you find that right now the Biden administration's energy policies realistic when it comes to these energy trade-offs with, with climate goals? Um, I've, I've noticed that he's you know, tried to put some marks down on preserving you know, vast areas of forest while opening up areas to uh, oil development and, and whatnot that you, w you would not have thought of Joe Biden would have done. Where is Joe Biden in all of this? Well, I think, it's, I think they're, they're feeling the pressures coming from different directions. One, they came in with a very strong climate uh, objective uh, right from the day he was in the Oval Office on the first day to the fact that... Oh, do you think John Kerry likes Joe Biden's energy policies? Well, I think he, John Kerry is even saying, well, you can still use natural gas if you abate the carbon. Hmm. So uh, I think there's an evolution there. And they looked at it, and I think they also saw that, in fact, energy security had fallen off the agenda in the United States because of the shale revolution. It came back and measured in terms of high prices. And so I think we've also had them encouraging domestic, you know, domestic energy production. So I think it's been complicated for them to how to put these two positions, energy security and energy uh, and energy transition together. I would not have expected um, France, a key partner, recently hosted with a state dinner here in Washington, to be the one to throw the first big crack in that with regards to China's place in the world. Well, I think that uh, obviously Europe looks at China differently as a very important market. Uh, Macron has always had, you know, he was the one who thought, well, I can persuade uh, Putin, you know, not to go to war or to stop it. And I think he's trying to, you know, in a sort of Charles de Gaulle way, uh, have an independent French foreign policy. But he's also part of the EU and he's part of NATO. I imagine there was some pretty strong back channel communication uh, about uh, messaging there. And of course, the president of the EU was along with, with him and she was left out of some of the very important meetings because she's taken a different line on China. So I think if you're looking to the future, uh, Steve, clearly the most important and the most dangerous issue is this great power competition and how particularly China and the United States manage it to avoid conflict. And you know, I write about the dangers of the South China Sea, which people are not f much focused on, obviously Taiwan. I think that, that that's going to be the dominating geopolitical issue and it's going to take real statecraft to manage it. Well, with that, Daniel Jurgen, Vice Chairman of S&P Global, economic historian, and most recently author of The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Read it. It's fantastic. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? It seems the United States has finally reached the tipping point of how far its sanctions can go. For decades, it's been waging or threatening financial warfare on dozens of countries that don't follow its rules. Some are invading other countries, and some are committing human rights violations. Some are running transnational criminal operations. But whatever the reasons, more and more nations are now working hard to make sure the United States can't simply shut them down, just like that. So they're looking for new ways to trade in currencies beyond the dollar, which will eventually weaken the greenback as the undisputed reserve currency of the world. Ironically, the sanctions that were built to preserve America's power might be actually weakening it. It's a long way from happening, and the dollar is still king, but the toe is in the door. Some folks will say, yay, finally, an end to American hypocrisy and imperialism. But it also comes with a whole world of pain and instability until the chaos eventually gives way to some other new world order. And that's the bottom line.